my good friend, Graham Phillips. Right, I have got to do something I don't normally do, and that's stand dead still, because most people who've seen me talk before realise I walk up and down the stage a lot, but if I move, it'll mess up the microphone. <laughs> if that's the camera that's on me, I can look into the camera every so often and look cool. <laughs> um, one thing Andy didn't mention, for those who know about Strange Phenomena and the magazine that we did years ago, is we did it from a Victorian house called Number 19 Oaks Crescent in Wolverhampton in central England. Now... He said we got to two issues of this thing, right? The second issue, for some mad reason, we decided to print up 40,000 copies. And we only had about 500 readers. And in the end, we just couldn't get rid of them. We tried to sell them. I mean, Andy and myself literally drove around the country in a hired van trying to sort of dump them in, <laughs> get various shops to take them on and stuff. And uh, so we ended up sort of throwing them all into the cellars below number 90 Notes Crescent. Now, this was like, I don't know, 30-something years ago. <laughs> Finally, the other day, I went past there with my friend Jody. We were driving around Wolverham. I said, oh, I'll show you where we used to live and we used to have this, run this magazine from. And 19 Oaks Crescent was up for rent. So I was able, literally, to go up to the window and peer through and spoke to the estate agent and said, yeah, we, you can come and have a look round it. So I was going to go and have a look round it, but then something happened and they couldn't get the key and it was cancelled. And then she phoned me, literally, just this morning, strangely enough, and said, it's the weekend, this is the estate agent, you want to come and look round the place? I said, I probably won't be able to now. She said, we've got one or two other people who want to see it. I said, do you know by any chance whether or not anyone's ever been into the cellar. She said, funny you should say that. We've found the cellar door for the first time under the carpet since we've been running this place. <laughs> and the cellars are full of old rotting magazines. <laughs> so there you go. Anyway, on a more sane note, my book, End of Eden, is basically about the fact that around about the year 1500, B.C., three and a half thousand years ago, monotheistic or one god religion started appearing all around the world at approximately the same time. It is something that many researchers seem to have, I wouldn't necessarily ignored, but seem to have assumed that, well, people tend to do things at the same time. It's like you get cave paintings appearing at about the same time throughout the world, and you get this happening and that happening around the same time. But why suddenly around 1500 BC you've got monotheistic religions all appearing roughly at the same time around the world is, is something of a mystery that's never really been fully explained. But that isn't the greatest mystery of all. The really big mystery is that this new God... Let me just give you some examples. In Egypt, it was the reign of Thutmosis III, and suddenly a new God came into existence called the Artan. Now, it wasn't for about 150 years until this god became really important in its own right and was established as like the one god uh, state religion of Egypt by the pharaoh Akhenaten, which means the son of the Artan, who was actually really called Amenhotep IV, but that's another story. But this Artan religion, which basically relieved in one god and all the others were just false started around 1500 BC. In China, I won't de you know, bore you with the, all the details, but they started having a one god religion. The Olmecs in Central America suddenly for a while started experimenting with a, a one god religion. The period that if you really look at the Bible and study it in a kind of half a sensible chronological way, you will find that the period that the Israelites really first seem to be adopting a single god is around about the year 1500 BC. Now, okay, you're saying, well, maybe there's not like some communication between them. Not really, not between China, the Middle East, not between the Middle East and the Olmecs in Central America. But what makes it more weird still is that English? More weird still? More weirder. Weirder stiller. 
is the fact that nearly all these civilizations started representing this god in the same way. Now, mostly throughout the world, gods were depicted as either animal-headed gods or strange-looking human beings with wings or whatever. But suddenly, throughout the world, in China, in Egypt, the Hittite Empire, which is basically what's now Turkey, uh, Assyria, um, the Mesopotamia area, in now what's Iraq, uh, and in the old Mech area of Mexico, all these religions started depicting their new one god as what is often described as a winged or flying disc, a circle with wings to either side, or a circle with a number of lines coming from it, known as a raid disc. Now, what anthropologists tend to tell you is, well, this suddenly is the time when people started worshipping the sun, these winged discs, this raid disc. It's the sun. Now, many of you may be familiar with the Artan sun di raid disc that Akhenaten started to worship in around about 1350, 1360 BC. It's a circle and it's got a lot of lines coming out from it. It's actually shown on Tutankhamun's tomb because Tutankhamun seems to have been Akhenaten's successor. And he, for a while, followed this same religion, believing in this one god, the Artan, that was represented by this disc with these rays coming underneath it, which is called the ray disc. Now, everybody assumes it was the sun. Yes, the Artan did become known later, certainly, in Egyptian mythology as one of the sun gods, one aspect of the sun. I won't bore you with the details. But basically, the bottom line is you've got this circular thing with lines coming out of it. The Olmecs that have been found in, middle, in, in, in Central America, in, in Mexico, various early Olmec representations of their one god. We don't know what it was called because we, don't, haven't, had, we, haven't, been able to translate, we haven't translated their language at that point yet. A circle with these lines coming from it looks exactly the same. In China, I told you that in China, they suddenly for a short while started worshipping a new god called Chu. This was a circle with lines coming from it, but at a slight angle. Some of these winged discs that appeared in Assyria and the Hittite Empire and places in Mesopotamia, also in what's now Iran, uh, they are like a circle with wings and underneath it is a fanned tail that people say, oh, it's like a bird's tail. But some of the earliest representations of it are all these lines coming out. So apart from the wings, you take the wings off and they're all exactly the same. A circle with lines coming out of it, either downwards or to the side. <clears throat> the wings just seem to have been put on by some civilizations at a slightly later date to show that this thing flies and is in the sky. So the, most of the anthropologists throughout the world will <clears throat> turn around and say, quite simply, that the winged disc is the sun. Well, around 1500 BC, everyone started worshipping the sun. Why? Now, let's look at this again. Everyone assumes it was the sun because the art and later became part of a sun kind of worshipping religion in Egypt. But when it first came out, if you like, around 1500 BC. No one said it, it was just called the Artan. We don't know what it was supposed to be. It was a circle with lines from it. But in Egypt at that time, the sun was represented by a circle with wings without lines. So they had their own wing disc, but it didn't have this tail underneath it. And that represented the sun. So what is this sun with lines? And why do the rays only go like that? And why in China do the rays go off to one side? And why in almost every case are there ten lines, ten rays? Central America, China, India, I forgot to mention them in the Indus Valley, um, set, uh, the, the Middle East, all around the world, you've got this circle with these ten lines coming from it. It's got to be the same. Why represent the sun with, in exactly the same way? It's, it's just nuts unless there is some connection. Well, there's clearly not a connection between all these different civilizations who are coming from all over the place, but what there is, 
is a possibility that they're all viewing the same thing in the sky. And if they all suddenly decide, wow, this thing is so amazing, let's make it into our one god, it's better than all the other gods, it must have been pretty spectacular. And it wasn't the sun, because the sun had been there for years. It's still there, apparently. <laughs> but, so this must have been something that looks like this thing with rays coming out of it, what could it be? Well, it just so happens that there's a description from the year 1486 BC, I won't tell you how we worked that out, but it kind of pretty much fits, from Egypt, which describes this huge, great, fiery thing in the sky about the same size as the sun or moon as we see it from the Earth. And it got bigger, and it got closer, and it had rays coming from it and it outshone the moon and even almost the sun at night. Now, maybe that's a bit of an exaggeration. And some people have gone so far as to say, well, it was an alien spaceship. Well, if it was, it stayed in the sky in the same place for about three months. <laughs> Pretty slow moving, I'd have said. It's, no, it's something else. It's got to be something else. But it also happens that when you look through the almanacs of the ancient Chinese astronomers, they have got, they recorded various heavenly celestial events, eclipses and so forth. And for the year 1486 BC, or from working out what their calendar is, the equivalent, 1486 BC, we see that they recorded a huge comet in the sky. A ten-tailed comet. Now you think, oh, comets have only got one tail. No, comets are seen with two, three, four, five... One of the biggest in recorded history in more recent times was an eight-tailed comet that appeared in 1744. Um, comets can get so close or they can be so big that they can appear three or four times the size of the moon. In our lifetimes, we haven't seen these sort of things, but over history, these have been recorded. And the Chinese had been recording comets for years. And this huge <coughs> ten-tailed comet had appeared. And the way that they, sh they show in, their, in these old, known as the silk almanacs, because they were drawn in silk, um, drawn on silk, they draw the different phrases, phases of this comet as the weeks go by. And at one point, it is overhead, like a full moon in the sky, with all these rays of light coming from it underneath, exactly like the Artem symbol looks like, which you can see on Tutankhamun's throne which was the symbol used by Akhenaten. A few months later, as in on these Chinese tomb inscriptions and on various pottery, we have it with the tails out to the side, just like it's depicted there. And again, take the Olmecs, for example. They have this circular disc with the lines coming out of it in exactly the same way and at exactly the same time. So there's no doubt that it was a comet that suddenly so shocked everybody that it made them think this god has got to be better than all the rest of them. We've never seen anything like this before. So that could explain, in fact, as far as I'm concerned, it probably does, why monotheism, monotheism what the belief in just one new god, suddenly appeared throughout the world at around about the same time. In fact, we can pretty much put the date as 1486 BC when this comet appeared. Now, does it stop there? Do celestial events, do natural events stop there to bring about the birth of monotheism, the belief in one God? Well, no, in many countries it died out pretty quickly. It did in China. The Olmecs soon started worshipping all sorts of gods and chopping people's heads off to worship them. Great. But in one place it carried on. There was a few places it carried on, one place that we know of quite well, and that is ancient Egypt. Because by 1350 BC, the pharaoh Akhenaten, or as I said before, Amenhotep IV, who changed his name to Akhenaten, worshipper or devotee of the Aten, suddenly decides to make the Aten, or at least he's following this belief, this sect that believes that the Aten, that looked like this raid disc, was one single god, the only god. And he basically made it the state religion of Egypt. Now, he, didn't, he lasted for about 17 years. He pretty much changed all of Egyptian society to believe in this one god. Shortly after he died, 
the priesthood decided that that was not on and they started persecuting anybody who had followed Akhenaten and they basically went around smashing up and getting rid of tomb inscriptions that mention him and all about his beliefs. So it's incredible, really, that we know anything about what he actually believed in. But, as I say, at the very beginning of his reign, Tutankhamun was one person who followed this religion and there's a, a, on, on, on his throne there is a picture of him and his, and his wife, who happens to be Akhenaten's daughter, with this art and symbol, the ray disc, over their heads. Now, we don't exactly know what happened to all the followers of Akhenaten, but we do know one thing. He set slaves free. He didn't believe in slavery. And one lot, of, one lot of slaves he actually set free were in the city of Avaris, once known as Pyranesis, the city of Ramesses. But it was only called that much later. At the time of Akhenaten, it was known as Avaris. He set a lot of these fr slaves free. These slaves had been brought into Egypt as early as the time of, Tut of, of Tutmosis III, which is 150 years earlier, by the Egyptians when they were fighting against the Hittites from Turkey. These people were known as Semites. They were the early Israelites. Now, it seems that because these people were made free, they started following the religion of Akhenaten, this one god. Now, some people would say, oh, no, the one god started with the, with the Israelite people. It had nothing to do with Egypt. But clearly the Israelites were following Egyptian gods before they took on their own because, just read the Old Testament in the Bible, it says that when Moses went up the Mount Sinai, when he went up Mount Sinai to collect the Ten Commandments, what happened was that the people began worshipping a golden calf. And this, it says in the Bible, is an Egyptian god. Why are you worshipping these gods, says Moses, when you come back? Well, we didn't think you were coming back. We thought we'd better go back to worshipping the old gods. Even the Ark of the Covenant they made, the Ark, comes from the Egyptian word bark, which is a thing they used to carry around sacred statues of gods in. So it's clear that once they were following the Egyptian religion when they were living there, but Akhenaten, because he set them all free, they thought, well, we prefer your god. So it was then, after Akhenaten's death and the backlash of the priesthood who started trying to get rid of any evidence of the religion of Akhenaten and this one god, that what happened was that pretty much people in Egypt either killed off or stopped worshipping that one god religion, but the slaves who had been freed, the, the Israelites, carried on worshipping that one god religion and called their god something else. Later we know that god as Jehovah, but originally, according to some of the earliest Hebrew texts there are, the original god was known as Atel, which At and Atel, it could be a similar sounding name, but anyway, we've got continuation of a one god religion. Now, it could have died out there, but why didn't it? because something rather spectacular happened. Now, if what the Bible tells us is true is that the pharaoh, whoever decided to let them go, presumably whoever followed Akhenaten at some point, um, decides he wants to bring them back into Egypt. Um, why did he let them go? Apparently there was ten plagues that affected Egypt. A plague of darkness, it went dark, even during the day for three days and three nights. Fiery hail descended from the heavens. Cattle dropped dead in the fields and the Nile turned to blood, a number of other things too. Well, it just so happens that if we're talking around about the year 1350 BC, there was a massive volcanic eruption in the middle of the Mediterranean on an island called Santorini, a volcano called Thera, which blasted um, a huge great ash cloud right over the direction of Egypt. Now we know this because there has been samples taken from the seabed around where the island of Santorini is. So we know which way the, 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 um, the wind was blowing. We know it could have taken such a, a big ash cloud as far as Egypt easily. Samples have even been found of this ash in Egypt. We also know People, a lot of people have said, you will see documentaries on TV sometimes saying, oh, no, no, this eruption of Santorini took place in about 1600 BC. That is based on radiocarbon dating. It is now realised that radiocarbon dating any earlier than around about 1350 goes haywire. 
In other words, the amount of carbon-14, don't worry about what that is, in the atmosphere was much either higher or lower before that than anyone previously realised. Why? Because Santorini eruption was so huge, it makes the eruption of Krakatoa or St. Mount St. Helens in America dwarf by comparison. It'd be like a few thousand or even a million atomic <coughs> weapons being put in one place and going boom. What remains of the, the, the mountain or the, the volcano of, Santor of Thera on Santorini now is a 10 mile wide crater filled with the sea of which the bottom is so deep that it is said that no ship's anchor touches the bottom. The thing just literally exploded. It was a, a massive, massive volcanic eruption, probably almost certainly the largest in the history of the human race, yet alone civilization. We're talking about in half a million years. This blew a cloud over Egypt. Um, once it was, well, the reason we know, by the way, the, the date is around about 1350 to 1360 BC is from ice core samples taken from Greenland. Every year when the, when the snow falls on the, um, on the ice caps in Greenland, um, a new layer of ice is formed, and it happens every year. So you can drill down, taking ice cores from, the, from under the ground, through the ice, and each year is almost like the rings in a tree to tell you how many years ago something happened. You can say that's one year's ice, two, three, going all the way back. And each, and the bubbles, the air bubbles caught in the ice can tell you something about the atmosphere at the time. And they can tell when volcanic eruptions took place because there's a different acidity in the atmosphere. And so we know based on this exactly that within a, just about 10, 20 years either way, that around about 1350 BC, a massive eruption happened somewhere in the world and it probably happened, it must, well, only the eruption we know of that magnitude was the eruption of Santorini. Okay, so how does this affect Egypt? We know that this must have done something like Mount St. Helens that went up in the state of Washington um, in, in, in 1980, was it 81? Anyway, a massive volcanic eruption. 500 miles away from Mount St. Helens in a place called Billings in Montana, it was dark as night for three days on end. Sound familiar? Secondly, around just outside the, ha the, the town of Billings, cattle started falling dead in the fields. Humans can go around doing this when ash falls down. The kind of ash you're breathing in is basically made up of tiny bits of shreds of almost like glass that get in your lungs and tear them to bits if you're not doing that indoors or got something covering your face. Cattle can't do this, they die in the fields. Sound familiar? Another thing that it says in the Bible is that the, that the Nile turned to blood. The main form of pumice that was being blasted out of Santorini, out of Mount Thera, the, the, the volcano, contained a vast amount of iron oxide. Iron oxide is that, that um, red stuff that litters the surface of Mars put it in water, it turns red. There are still small underground eruptions in the sea around Santorini today, and the sea will go blood red. The Nile turned to blood. I won't bother to bore you with all the details about how uh, plagues of flies and, and plagues of other things took place at the time that could tie up with a volcano, but uh, you just have to take my word for it that they did. If you want to go on my website, which is grahamphillips.net, it's all there, you give all the examples on there, you just follow the links to my book, Act of God, and you'll see it all there. It's all, you don't have to buy the book necessarily, you just see it online. But all these plagues and things seem to have f followed on from this eruption. Now, what happens is that the Moses, or whoever it was, who happened to lead the Israelites out of Egypt, suddenly manages to have a great power of persuasion over his followers. And why do they continue to believe in this one religion so vehemently for so long when many other religions rise and fall? Well, if you suddenly saw that and this guy said, well, God will punish us, the Pharaoh doesn't let us go, and suddenly that happens? Darkness, Nile turning to blood, fiery pumice coming from the sky? Well, I'd certainly believe in it. <laughs> so, 
Is there a Moses, incidentally? Well, yes, in 1350 BC. Remember I mentioned the fellow Akhenaten, who was the one who started this one god religion. Well, at least he, he didn't start it, but he, became, he made it the, um, the state religion of Egypt. He had a brother called Tutmosis, not to be confused with the pharaoh Tutmosis the third I mentioned before. Tutmosis actually means son of the god Thoth, Tut. The Moses bit just means son of. Moses is described in the Hebrew Bible as simply the son of God. Moses, Tutmosis, the name, the similarity. This guy was originally going to be the pharaoh of Egypt. We're told in the Bible that Moses was treated as the brother of the pharaoh. He was raised to a high position in the Egyptian court. We also know that this brother of Akhenaten became like the Grand Vizier. He was the Prime Minister, if you like, of the country. And interestingly enough, most of the things in the Bible tell us that all these miracles performed by Moses were performed with him with this staff, this stick. Now, there is a staff that was found in uh, a place called Petra, which is in Jordan, bearing the name of this guy, Tuck Moses, the brother of Akhenaten, saying he was the Prime Minister, the Grand Vizier of Egypt, and that this stick belonged to him. It was his staff of office. Incre so in other words, this guy who may be the historical Moses, because he disappears at exactly the time as the historical Moses or the Moses of the Bible appears in history, we don't know what happened to him, he just vanishes, and then Akhenaten takes over as Pharaoh. <laughs> If this is your historical real Moses, then this stick with which apparently, according to the Bible, he parts the Red Sea, he makes the skies go dark for three days, and he turns the Nile to blood. Obviously, this is the volcano. If I'm correct, this waving of the stick around is simply coincidence, or is it? But that stick is now in, in the Municipal Museum in Birmingham, in England. <laughs> Yeah, it was found by archaeologists in the 1850s, and it's on display. And right next to it are three rings, one belonging to Akhenaten, one belonging to his wife Nefertiti, and one belonging to somebody who may have been their son, Smenkare. And it was there. And, uh, and when, when I basically, I did a documentary once, and they, we went and were filmed in, in, in Birmingham Museum, and I said, well, that, this is what I believe is the, is the staff that belonged to the man who could have been Moses. Incredibly, it could have been the thing that he parted the Red Sea with. And they showed a bit of the film of Charlton Eston standing there, you know, in the, in the Bible film, making the Red Sea part. The um, curator stormed out. Next week, the thing was removed. And it wasn't on display there until, but I went there a couple of months ago, it's back. So I'll go and get a photograph of it before it disappears again. But it's there, it just says, uh, Staff of Tutmosis, Vizier of Egypt, blah de blah de blah Anyway, <clears throat> the reason I'm saying all this is that all this volcanic eruption seemed to have been given great reason for people to continue to believe in this one God. A one God that had started because of something miraculous, probably the biggest comet we've ever known in history, being seen in the sky, followed then by a volcanic eruption that just so happens to benefit these slaves that had been fleeing from Egypt. <clears throat> okay, what about the parting of the Red Sea? The actual original Hebrew Bible doesn't call it the Red Sea, it calls it the Sea of Reeds. And the Sea of Reeds is a, an area in northern, uh, northeastern Egypt, uh, a shallow water with reeds, full of reeds, hence the Sea of Reeds. It's quite a large area, but it's passable um, at low tide. But if the water rises too high, Anybody trying to get through this water, especially if you've got something like a chariot, will get bogged down. You'll get stuck in the mud and you'll probably drown. When Santorini went up, the tidal waves going up and down the Mediterranean, literally like water in the bath, carried on for days with high and low tides that don't normally happen in the Mediterranean. If the the Israelites had fleed from Avaris, within about a day they could have reached the area of the Sea of Reeds and passed through this muddy area. But with the 
tides going up and down and up and down, dramatically um, high tides for that area, every few hours for a few days after the massive eruption, the tidal wave it created, water up and down in the bath, as I said, and the Pharaoh's army had followed, they could have easily have got washed away. God parted the sea. Well, the land turned from water to dry land, because before a tidal wave arrives, before a tsunami arrives, the sea pulls back, the, land, uh, the, 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 the um, beaches which are normally underwater become visible for perhaps up to hours before the tsunami arrives, and then whoosh, they're swept away. Again, another phenomenon, a natural phenomenon caused by the volcano which could have helped the Israelites escape. Now, I'm not saying that every word in the Bible is true, but certainly there would have been three days of darkness, there would have been fiery hailstones, there'd have been loads of things that are, the Bible says happened. And they're all happening to be of benefit to the Israelites, the people who believe this one God. Okay, fair enough. They escape, they go into the desert, and they finally arrive. Moses leads them to a mountain where he says God lives known as Mount Sinai or the mountain of God or Mount Horeb, mountain of God. When he arrives there, um, cutting a long story short, the Bible describes pretty much in detail what the area looks like. It is said that they arrived, the Israelites, at a place called the, uh, the Passage of Kadesh. It is said also that the Israelites are so thirsty that Moses uses his staff again, the one in Birmingham Museum. <laughs> he bashes a rock, and water comes through, comes through, comes from the rock. A stream is created, the stream of Moses, which then gives water to the Israelites and stops them from dying in the desert. Now, the next, but in, in, in one description, in one of the books of the Old Testament, in Exodus, I believe it is, it, it, it doesn't say where this actually takes place. But in another, I believe it's Leviticus, I might be wrong, but elsewhere in the Bible, it talks about the staff that Moses bashes on the rock in order to create this miraculous stream takes place at somewhere it describes as the rock of the rock in Horeb. Now remember I said that Horeb was another name for Mount Sinai or the mountain of God. Horeb basically means something like holy mountain in the desert. In other words, it's telling us that the place where Moses is making this uh, rock produce water and this sacred stream, this miraculous stream, is at the mountain of God, is at Mount Sinai. Now, strangely enough, Israelite tradition, Jewish, modern Jewish tradition, doesn't tell us where that is. But in Jordan, there is a local Bedouin tradition that that very place called the Spring of Moses, or Ein Yusa in Arabic, is in the old city of Petra in the deserts of Jordan. And the city that survives there now was used in part of the Indiana Jones film about the Holy Grail, where he goes to that place where the grail is kept at the end, where he rides through that gaps in the rock and there's that huge great thing carved out in the rock face. That is part of the ancient city of Petra. It was built around about Roman times, but we're talking about something much earlier. And what happens is that you go to Petra today, and you will find that there is still an, a, a shrine, an Islamic shrine called Ain Musa, which the local Bedouin believe is the place that Moses hit the rock and created his miraculous stream. So we think, oh, well, okay, this must be, if the Bible's correct, and if the ancient Bedouin are correct, then the, the mountain that rises above it must be the mountain of God, the mountain where God appeared to Moses and gave him the Ten Commandments, where they made the Ark of the Covenant. And you look up on the mountain, and the mountain above you is known as Jebel Madaba, mountain of the high place. Now... There are some interesting things that the mountain of the high place, Jebel Madaba, fits exactly with what the Bible tells us the mountain of God, Mount Sinai, is like. First of all, the Bible tells us that there are two levels to the mountain. 
There is the higher level and the lower level, the upper and nether level, as it's called. And on the lower level, the Israelite elders remained while Moses went across a sort of land bridge, if you like, to the higher level where he spoke to God. You climb up Jebel Madaba today and you reach a plain, uh, 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 sorry, a terrace, a artificially created terrace cut out in the sandstone. No one knows what date it really comes, it, how far it dates back to, but it could be of what's known as Edomite origin. It could be, date back as far as 1500 BC. So it could have been there in Moses' time. But the interesting thing is, there are two great big obelisks about 18 feet high and about that wide in the middle of this plateau. And incredibly, sometime around three and a half thousand years ago, the people who lived there had literally cut down 18 feet of sandstone of an area that's larger than this room down to leave these freestanding pillars. The pillars aren't built. It's everything around them that's cut away to leave them standing there. Now, these are known locally, traditionally, by the Bedouin people as the feet of God. Another thing about it is that the archaeological research that has been done around the area has found that there is um, a lot of uh, blue uh, slate that had once been polished in ancient times that they think was used as paving for this flat, terraced area. It's actually known as the terrace. So, what you have? Two obelisks called the feet of God. You've got an area which is flat and covered in pavings of shiny blue rock. The Bible says, when the ancient Israelite elders arrived at the nether region, the lower part of the mountain, they saw a terrace which shone like sapphire stone. Blue stone? Blue terrace? And there, God stood astride the, the terrace. Now, the feet of God, God standing astride, you can see how the whole sort of myth may have come about. And of course, if this is where the, the place where the, where, the, where the elders of Israel remained when Moses went to the top, then when Moses got to the top, well, let's <coughs> see what happens. When you, when you walk up the... The, like a kind of connecting um, uh, strip of land that connects that bit of the mountain with the very summit of the mountain, when you get to the top, you find what is, what is basically an old temple cut out in the rock. It's not got a roof, it's an open-air temple, but it was something that could date back to around about the time of, our, of Moses, and it was some place where they did sacrificial offerings. It was a temple to some god or other, we don't know who. But from local um, inscriptions that have been found, most archaeologists believe it was some ancient mountain god that was worshipped there. Now imagine that Moses did lead his people there. They saw these pillars and they're, they're, they're at this mountain and Moses goes up there and he comes back down and he says, well, you know, I've got these Ten Commandments here. You shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. God's told me to do this, God's told me to do that. Well, of course, when he gets down according to the Bible, he finds they've started worshipping his golden calf. Of course, one of the commandments accidentally, but one of the f first ones incidentally, is thou shalt not kill. So God immediately tells Moses to kill all those who worship the calf. Sounds a bit strange, but anyway, that's what we're told. So... Why do they then carry on believing in this one God? Well, it is said in the Bible that when the Israelites were at the bottom of the mountain of God, suddenly, as Moses came down and he was there with his Ten Commandment tablets, which incidentally broke because he got so mad at these people worshipping this golden calf, there came the sound of a great trumpet. It says in one of the versions of the Old Testament that it was an angel that blew this trumpet so loud that all the Israelites were seen afraid and they believed what Moses told them. When you go to the area at the bottom of the mountain, there is a, there is a, a deep gorge between the rocks. That's the bit where you see Indiana Jones riding through at the end of the film Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. I think that's what it's called, the one when he looks for the cup anyway. When the wind blows from a certain direction, 
the noise that is made as it blows through this rock is, well, the only way I can describe it is like a cacophony of Buddhist prayer horns. <laughs> now imagine that had happened when Moses just turns up and he sort of has, oh, you have to believe me, go and kill those people who are being worshipped in the golden calf. Well, we don't believe you speak for God. <laughs> Once again, some strange natural phenomena is causing people to continue to believe in this one God, monotheism. Okay, does it stop there? Does it buggery? <laughs> we, are t- uh, we are told that such a, f- a few uh, that the, that the, that the, that the, that the, um, the Israelites are forced to wander the in the, in the Sinai wilderness for 40 years. I won't bother boring you with the details of what the Bible tells us, that they, that why that had to happen. But they're in the wilderness for 40 years, pretty much until they are strong enough to attack the people and take over the land of Canaan. Now, Canaan is the land of we now call Israel, pretty much. And it is where the original Israelites had come from when they'd been seized by Tutmosis III's troops and taken back as slaves around 1300 B- sorry, 1500 BC. So, okay, so they're taken into Egypt, they're kept slaves, they get out, but they find by now there are different people living in their homeland, their Semite homeland as it was known, and these people are the Canaanites. And the Canaanites have called this area Canaan. And according to the scriptures, the prophecies, and what Moses has told them, this is the promised land. It is your promised land where you may go back to and you may have as your homeland. Well, of course, there's people already living there. And no one, of course, is very happy about this at all. So, what happens next? Okay, what happens next is that we are told that after Moses dies, the man who leads the Israelites is known as Joshua. Joshua is a soldier more than a a, a priest, as Moses appears to be. And as a soldier, he decides he's somehow going to have to take the capital city at the time of Canaan, which is called Jericho. Now, you may have all heard that song, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. According to the Bible, the Ark of the Covenant, which contains the two Ten Commandment tablets that Moses went back up and got, and he had to get a second set from God because he broke the first set, put them in the Ark, and somehow this Ark had the power of almost like, as I think the Indiana Jones film says, it calls it a radio for talking to God. It's also sort of lightning comes blasting out the front of it, and it somehow manages to destroy uh, armies that oppose the Israelites. They have to march around the walls. Well, by the way, Jericho, the capital city of the Canaanites, um, is so well defended with these huge walls, no one's ever taken it on. The Israelites are many in number, but they can't besiege this city. They can't stay out in the desert for that long, and they can't break the walls. But Joshua says, well, God tells me to walk round and round the walls and uh, for seven days. And after seven days, they carry the ark round and round the walls, and then the priests all blow these ram's horns, and the walls come crashing down, and then the Israelites can go charging into the, in, into the remains of Jericho. And God then tells them, no one's saying this God is a God of love at this point. It is the only God, but not the God of love, because he says, God apparently says, that they must kill every man, woman, child, and animal that's still alive inside Jericho. And they do. So, okay, is this true? Did it happen? Didn't it happen? Well, the fact of the matter is that archaeological research that has now been done at the ancient city of Jericho, which is not too far from Jerusalem, um, they have found that there is an area of the... Hill, the, 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 like a hill fort, if you like, which would have been the city back at the time of Moses, where the walls had come crashing down. And they were able to find small pollen grains underneath the walls, which have been dated to around about... Well, in fact, the central carbon dating at that point is 1315 B.C., Now, this is before all the carbon dating starts to go crazy, um, because that starts with Santorini, but that all sounds complicated. But basically, what I'm saying is we've got a period of around about 1315 BC when these walls have have come tumbling down. 
Go back 40 years earlier, which is the period that we're supposed to, that, um, that the Israelites are supposed to have remained in the wilderness, and we end up at around about 50, sorry, uh, 55, 1355 BC, which is approximately the time that Santorini seems to have gone up. Santorini goes up, Israelites escape from Egypt, attack Jericho 40 years later, walls come tumbling down. It ties up. Now, how did the walls of Jericho come tumbling down? Well, archaeological research that has been done there by archaeologists from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem have now shown quite conclusively that they were brought down by an earthquake. Yet another strange natural disaster that just so happens to favour people worshipping one god? Well, I could go on and on and on, but it doesn't stop there because for many, many years, these people who are following this one God, known first as the Israelites and later as the Jews, named after the tribe of Judah, which was the largest of the tribes of Israel, which pretty much went on to dominate the whole of the, the Hebrew religion thereafter. They were known as the Judeans by the, the Romans, hence the Jews or Judaism. Suddenly, another very strange thing. I mean, Judaism is not really doing too well. It's only in a small area of the Roman Empire in some, what we now call southern Israel. So we end up with a situation whereby, yeah, you've still got people believing in one God. Over the years, there's been many natural disasters or, or natural um, celestial events which seem to have just so favoured the, the religion just believing in this one God. But then it's, it's only there ain't that many people following it. But then something suddenly changes. A guy is born in a little town called Bethlehem, who then goes on to do things that others then later interpret in a way that spreads monotheism throughout the whole world. Obviously, we're talking about Jesus. Incidentally, people have said to me, was his name actually Jesus Christ? Well, if you actually went back to ancient Jerusalem or Bethlehem and said, hello, is there Mr. Christ around? <laughs> no, his name wasn't Christ. Christ is, is basically the Greek version or Christos Greek version of the Hebrew word Messiah, which meant anointed one. Somebody who the ancient Jews had believed was going to come back to the world one day and set the, the Jewish people, the Israelites, free from foreign oppression which around about the time when Jesus was born, sort of 2,000 years ago, meant the Romans. So this guy was going to come and set them free from the Romans, and they called him the Messiah, the Anointed One. It was going to be another King David, the man who uh, was the first king of all Israel before they were attacked and then invaded by a series of foreign invasions, including the Babylonians and the Greeks and the, and the Persians and, the, and others. But... What it says in the Old Testament is that the Messiah would come when certain signs took place. One of these was a star that was to appear in the sky and be seen above the birthplace of what had once been King David, which was Bethlehem. And this star would, this new star that would appear in the sky, would herald the birth of the Messiah. It just so happens in 4 BC, there was a strange, it is now known, you can even check it out. If you've got one of these Google things that, on your phone, that you can actually put a date into what the stars look like. There was a strange alignment of planets there, of Jupiter and Mars and Saturn, that basically made one big star in the sky that looked, for all intents and purposes, like a new star appeared in the sky. And from the east, in other words, from east of Jerusalem, which is where the three wise men are supposed to have come to visit the baby Jesus, it would have been pretty much most of the time, when you got to midnight anyway, over Bethlehem. So we could have directed them there. Now, this new star that appears in the sky for all intents and purposes suddenly makes a hell of a lot of people in Israel who aren't Jews, who are Romans and Greeks, slaves in particular, and women who didn't really have a big part to play in religion in Judaism at the time, suddenly start to say, this must be the birth of the Messiah. 
So cutting a long story short, everybody starts to believe what he says. Yet another strange celestial event that tends to suggest that the nature is on the side of this one God religion carrying on and carrying on and carrying on. Now, I'll leave it at that because there are other bits and pieces that you'll see if you read my book, The End of Eden, which I hope there are many copies out there which you'll all buy. But if there aren't any, don't worry, you can find it on my website, grahamphillips.net. But what I think I'm trying to say is I'm not saying that God did this. I'm not saying God didn't do this. I'm not saying it's aliens and you move stars around. I don't know. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that a series of very strange coincidences to do with natural events seems to have favoured the existence of monotheism, the belief in one God over others. Now, if you start to look at history and look at it thinking how many natural disasters, how many new celestial, strange celestial events have started other religions other beliefs, other ways of looking at things, you'll find there is one hell of a lot. I will draw you to just one before I finish. I think in about the year 1600, there was a new star appeared in the sky in the constellation of Cygnus the Swan. It wasn't a new star, it's what we now know as a supernova. It pretty much started what we now know as the Rosicrucian religion, which started what we now know pretty much as occultism, which started Blavatsky and all her lot doing what they did, which led to the foundation of what our good friend Rudolf Steiner did in this very place, which wouldn't have been here if it wasn't for the start in 1600. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.